Alright, so what we're going to do is, uh, right, you should have, for cellular aspiration, you should have glucose, which is C6H12O6, plus um, you should have uh, uh, six O2s going in, and then that gives you um, some products. They have six CO2 plus six H2O, and then um, what am I missing here, which is really the whole purpose of this process? Olivia. What was that? Energy. Yeah, energy. This is a, what kind of reaction? Ender or extragonic? This is a very extragonic reaction. So energy is released, and some of that energy is free energy, energy available to do work. What's the work that it's used to do? The energy is used to make something. Yeah, to make ATP. And when we say make ATP, how do we make ATP? What do we add to what? Ellie. We add an inorganic phosphate to an ATP. That's correct. So inorganic phosphate, remember, means that it's not attached to anything, and that uh, uh, is used to make ATP. And so because this reaction, ADP and phosphate making ATP, is a what kind of reaction? Endergonic. It needs energy. So this very extragonic reaction, we're going to see, drives this endergonic reaction, the production of ATP. Um, and this is way more extragonic. This releases a lot more energy than is needed to make one ATP. So we're going to see that there are many ATPs made from the breakdown of one glucose molecule. So this um, drives many of these. So the majority of cellular respiration takes place where in the cell? Um, where in the cell does the majority of cellular respiration take place? What do you think, um, Joel? In the mitochondria. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a nice big old mitochondria. So if this board is my um, cell, the mitochondria is one organelle in the cell. So here's my mitochondria. All right, and uh, what I just drew is the outer membrane of the mitochondria. There is also an inner membrane of the mitochondria. Um, what is true about the inner membrane of the mitochondria in terms of its structure? Madeline. It's folded and stretched out. Yeah, it has folds like this. And anybody remember what those folds are called? Jacob? Close. Starts with a C. Olivia? Christe, that's right. These are the folds. So why is it important um, that, what's the purpose of having the folds in the mitochondrial inner membrane like this? What does it do, Madeline? Increases surface area. So, um, so the inner membrane of the mitochondria is very, very important in this process of <coughs> cellular respiration. So let's look at now on um, the three major steps of cellular respiration. The first major step is called what? First major step to start breaking down our glucose molecule in order to get energy. Is Megan? Is glycolysis. Where does glycolysis occur in the cell, Julia? In the cytosol. In the cytosol. So in my picture here, the cytosol is out here, like the, the board is the cell, so this is the cytosol. And out here is this first step, and this first step we call glycolysis. And so <coughs> it doesn't actually take place in the mitochondria. On the second major step, is called what? Yeah, there's a the, called the link reaction or the intermediate step. That occurs, and they, they, they don't even call this a step, and I don't know why, because it has to happen in order for the next step to happen. Um, and so, <coughs> so the link reaction, we'll talk about here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this step one and a half, because your book doesn't even call it a, a particular step. So it's like in between the first and the second major step, and this is the link or the intermediate step. This doesn't really have a 
technical, everybody calls it by a certain name kind of stuff, all right? And so, <coughs> so this occurs kind of, we're going to see as we go into the mitochondria. Um, the second major step occurs in this part of the mitochondria. Um, does anybody know what this part of the mitochondria is called? What's this called in here? Olivia? Yeah, the mitochondrial matrix. I'm going to put here a matrix. And I'm going to put here a step two. Here, and step two occurs anywhere in this matrix here. And it has a special name. It could be called by one of two different names. Julia? The Krebs cycle. Yeah, it could be called the Krebs cycle or? Citric acid. Or citric acid cycle. So either one of those. And... So it's a cycle here. I'm just going to go around and around like this with some arrows here showing that it's a bunch of um, chemical reactions, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So that's your Krebs or citric acid cycle. And then the third step, the third step has one big name, um, but it actually has two parts that occur um, in it um, for it to occur. Um, the big name is two letters, uh, or two words, I should say. First one starts with an O. Oxidative phosphorylation. And this involves or This involves um, two things: the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. And so we'll look at both of those processes. <coughs> Which one of these steps is the majority of your ATP made? Because the purpose is to make ATP. One of these steps is really, really important for making ATP. Yeah, this here, the chemiosmosis here, and this third step is where the majority of your ATP is made. So therefore, the purpose of all these other steps beforehand is to break down glucose and strip electrons from glucose and carry those electrons to this third step, to the electron transport chain, which those electrons are used eventually um, to make ATP and this chemiosmosis. All right, so that's kind of the big picture of where things um, occur. So let's look at glycolysis first and get just look at the big picture here to kind of um, pull this all together. So glycolysis is the very first step. So we're starting out with a glucose molecule. So here you have a glucose molecule. And glucose is how many carbons big? Six, Six right? And glycolysis has two major steps. Um, or two major kind of series of reactions. The first one, you go through, and I'm just putting a bunch of arrows here. I'm showing you that you don't have to know all the intermediates of what goes on in glycolysis because it has like 10 steps in there. You don't have to know all those chemicals that are and so on. You just, I need you to know the big picture. So this is giving you a big picture here. Starting out with the glucose six carbon molecules. At the end, we end up with two molecules called G3P, or our packet called them PGAL. And these guys are three carbons long. All right, so instead of a six carbon molecule, we end up with two three carbon molecules. That's the first set of reactions. And then these ones further go through some reactions. And we end up with, at the end of glycolysis, two molecules of what? Does anybody remember what the two molecules are at the end of glycolysis? Megan? They are called pyruvate. And I talked about in the notes the relationship between pyruvate and pyruvic acid. Remember that uh, it depends on something that's acidic has the carboxyl group. And so um, it depends on if the carboxyl group is intact or if it's already acted as an acid. Remember, the carboxyl group gives off H pluses. And so this is um, the, the py, uh, with what, as it's already given off the H pluses. So this is pyruvate, pyruvic acid. They're really the same molecule depending upon if they've given off the H pluses. So, so either one of those are correct at the end of this. All right, so, so then. 
that's what happens. So these guys used to be a glucose molecule after these series of reactions. These reactions right here, from this one to this one, and from this one to this one, have names based upon what happens to, to them, which I haven't put up on the board yet. Do you have any idea of what they call those two different kind of steps or series of reactions in glycolysis as well? That's right. Which one's investment, the top one or the bottom? Uh, the first one. So here is your energy investment phase. And we have our energy payoff phase. I was just seeing if I can I'm in the field of view for the video. All right, somebody tell me why the first series of reactions is the energy investment phase. Why do they call it that? What's going on? Erica, what do you think? Yeah, you have to invest energy um, to get those two G3Ps or gals. Um, what's the energy invested in there? In the form of? The form of? Alan? ADP. ADP is the phosphate. Well, that's what you break it down into. Oh. The Ben? Two ATPs. Two ATPs. So. <coughs> So if right here, two different ATPs um, that are used, and when you see, uh, you know, in our textbook or in these packets here where you have an arrow kind of looking like this going in and then out, what this means is whatever is at the beginning of the arrow goes into these reactions and then what comes out of it. And so um, what happens is we break down the ATP into ADP. So, uh, and so we end up with two ADPs at the end here that are not used, but remember we lost, we're missing here a phosphate. Where did those phosphates go? They phosphorylated at intermediate. So I'm gonna put here, so there are molecules in here that have had a phosphate group attached to it. I just put X here because you don't, just molecule X. You don't need to know the names of the molecules and know exactly all of that. Um, but uh, that's what happens with the ATP is you phosphorylate the molecules or add those phosphate groups on them. All right, and so what you have is phospho two phosphorylated molecules at the end of this, and that's why it's the energy um, investment phase. But that initial input of energy pays off in the second set of reactions because what do we get off uh, uh, as a result of the second set of reactions? What do we get, Olivia? Four ATP. Yeah, you get four ATP. So therefore, I'm going to do another kind of thing here where we're going to end up with four ATP. And in this case here, if we get four ATP, what did we need to make ATP? What has to go in? Because remember, we have intermediates that are phosphorylated here. So I'll put molecule A here. So we have these intermediates that are phosphorylated. So the phosphates come off of these intermediates and have to be attached to what to make ATP? ADP. So therefore, you have to have four ADPs for that to happen. Okay? And so you end up with, as we talked about, even though we used 2 ATP, you get a gain of 4 ATP, so then we call it a net gain of 2 ATP here because you had to put 2 in to get 4 out, so really we all come out ahead 2 ATPs. So um, at the end of glycolysis, you get 2 ATP. Now, ATP, two, these two ATPs are really not enough to keep your cell alive. So if you only did glycolysis and made two ATP for every glucose molecule, eventually we would die and our cells would die and so on. And so, so really, making ATP is really not the purpose of glycolysis. Um, I left something out of this picture, um, and it's one of the purposes of glycolysis. Um, what did I leave off? Ellie? The NADHs that are made? Yeah, NADHs that are made. Uh, and so <clears throat> NADHs, I'm going to put this in a different color here. 
um, are made here. And to make an NADH, we need NAD plus, and then it strips two hydrogen off of these intermediate molecules that used to be glucose. So two hydrogen come off of those molecules, and we make, oops, we need two of those, and we make two NADH. Um, <coughs> so the hydrogen, what we're really doing is stripping electrons. And so each NADH carries, do you guys remember how many electrons? Two, two electrons. And so this is really, in red here, the main um, purpose of glycolysis is to begin breaking down glucose, stripping electrons from it, um, and then the pyruvate is going to continue on to the other um, steps and continue stripping electrons from it. Why are these electrons important? Because these electrons are going to come over here, NADH, and are going to be used in the electron transport chain. And so, and that's where you remember your majority of uh, ATP is made. So if there's no electrons at the electron transport chain, you don't get the majority of your ATP made and cells die. So this is really important to make these electron carriers, all right? And that is the purpose of glycolysis. So now let's go to that packet and look at the questions. Now that we looked at the big picture, I'm hoping that when we go over the answers to the packet, it makes a little bit more sense to you. Okay, so let's do that. Molecules. And 
so you, you have an input of energy there, so it would make sense that the molecule would have a higher potential energy. Um, when we look at number five, does pyruvate have more or less potential energy than glucose? So if we look at this, um, here is pyruvate. I don't know if you can see this here. Pyruvate has slightly, it's kind of down a little bit lower. It's supposed to be shown a little bit lower. So pyruvate actually has less potential energy than glucose. Why would that make sense? That this has less potential energy than your original molecule of glucose, please, Because you take out more ATP from it, even though you'll be really interested in Okay, yeah, so you, took, you only put an initial investment of two ATP, so you have some energy invested in there, and but then you took out and therefore the energy uh, uh, that was once in PGL is now in some of these four ATP molecules, absolutely. I also said that it was, well, it was broken out from um, the original glucose, so it, like, some of that energy is lost to heat. Okay, absolutely. Some of the energy is lost to heat. Um, and it's also some of the energy is now in the NADH molecules because we stripped the electrons from, all right, as well. So that's the other source of there. So all of those contribute. Uh, number six, what's the net production of ATP by glycolysis? You should have just two ATP. Um, it's, been, it's asking about the net. And then what molecule for seven acts as an electron acceptor? Um, NADH, um, but technically, actually, what actually accepts the electrons is actually NAD plus. Accepts the electrons and becomes NADH. All right? So technically, it's NAD plus is the acceptor of the electrons. On a, on a class, would you like have an NAD plus and NADH? Or no. No. Okay. And then lastly, um, in the steps, number eight, the steps of glycolysis, four ATP molecules are produced. It asks you to find the source of the four phosphates to make those four Na or four ATPs. And so if we look here, here's where your four ATPs are made. ADP goes in and ATP comes out. And notice here we have two of these BP. Um, G molecules. This is what these guys look like. Each one of these BP G molecules has one, two phosphates. So, and notice here, when that gets converted to pyruvate, there's no phosphates on pyruvate. So, therefore, you have one, two, so, th so th um, those two phosphates from this molecule goes to two ATPs <coughs> to make two ATPs. Well, you have two of those molecules, so you have an additional two of them, so you can make four ATPs. All right, and so that's where those come from. So they're off those two um, BPG molecules. All right. All right, so then let's look at the link reaction. And I haven't really talked about put this on the board here, but let's look at this here. Um, so if we add this to our big picture, this sometimes is called the link reaction or an intermediate step. Uh, uh, like I said, there's no actual name for it. Let's just relate this to our picture on the board. So, <coughs> so to go and to do this one and a half step, this is step one and a half, all right? So you have your pyruvate that are gonna enter into the mitochondria. So that's the step here. And <clears throat> these pyruvate, so this is from glycolysis. So this is from glycolysis on the board. Uh, and there are really how many of these? Two. Two. So therefore, this reaction happens twice. So um, for every pyruvate, you need uh, one CO2 is made, so that happens twice. So we have two of everything um, going in here to get eventually our two acetylcholines at the end. And so <coughs> pyruvate, all right, notice here, loses a CO2. This molecule coenzyme A is naturally found in the mitochondria. This is the mitochondria. Um, and it, it um, binds and makes acetyl-CoA. And then you get some NADH is made as well. And so it's this acetyl-CoA, somewhere right here, so our two pyruvate, as this link reaction happens, uh, gets converted into two acetyl-CoA's. And that, I'm gonna draw an arrow here, 
um, to the uh, to the citric acid cycle, that's what actually enters into the citric acid cycle. So the two pyruvates enter, get converted to two acetyl-CoA's, and then enters the citric acid cycle. So um, going in this big picture here, uh, some waste product is made. So this is your CO2. Uh, notice that we have six CO2's that leave as a waste product of cellular respiration. If we look at the big picture, two of those CO2's leave right now, all right? So therefore, from this reaction, we have our waste product of two CO2s, and this will, for organisms, will be breathed out. All right, so this will enter our bloodstream, go to our lungs, and breathe it out. But um, besides the two acetyl CoA's to go into this, the Krebs or citric acid cycle, another good thing that comes out of this is your electron carriers. So you get a little, a uh, few more NADHs made. So I'm going to get my red, red marker. Um, so in this um, case here, I'm going to keep uh, the picture, the, and all the NADHs is red. So from this step, from, like, from this line, I'm going to go back over here, and we have two NADHs. So I'll put here two NADHs coming from that intermediate step. We have the two NADHs coming from glycolysis, each carrying two electrons. So we're starting to get a bunch of electrons going to the electron transport chain, which are gonna be used to make ATP. So this whole link reaction is just, makes a little bit of NADHs, but to make that acetyl-CoA so that we can go to the next major step. All right, so let's answer the questions with this. But you know, that's technicality there. 
Um, but it's something that they kind of left off. Do you see that if it loses the CO2, it's not pyruvate, but it's not yet acetyl-CoA because the coenzyme A hasn't happened yet. All right, so that number, or letter B, how many carbons of the pyruvate molecule remain? Um, and you should have two, all right? So there's two because we lost one in CO2. And then the, at the end, we get acetyl-CoA, so that is C. And then D, the connection between coenzyme A and the acetyl group is weak. It asks you how is this illustrated. Um, it's not illustrated in here. It's D. So this is you see here the CoA to the rest of the molecule. The publisher made a mistake here. They were supposed to have a dashed line here to show that it's weak. Um, sometimes weak bonds can also be shown as a squiggly line as well, but it doesn't show anything of that nature. What guys put there? A slightly longer line. Okay, it is slightly longer, yeah, because it is longer than the other one. It was supposed to be a dashed one, all right, is what the publisher meant to, to do. All right, and then on 13, has ATP been used or produced in this step? You should have no there. On 14, have any other high energy molecules been produced? Yes, you should have. You should have that the NADH is made. Right, that's a high energy electron carrier. And then lastly, 15 asks you how many of each one of these uh, acetyl-CoA, carbon dioxide, and NADH are, are made in this reaction per glucose. So for one pyruvate, one of each is made, but this happens twice, so you should have two of each. Okay? All right? And so then, the, what goes in, we're going to run out of time, aren't we? All right. So we will talk about the Krebs cycle tomorrow. All right. So tomorrow we'll talk about the Krebs cycle, and then I'm going to pass back your oxidative phosphorylation packet. We're going to go over that and kind of pull.